Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and another video that is long overdue. I hope you're all well and it's not too cold where you are. Here in the UK there's been a definite shift in the weather and it's actually below freezing today. Where did autumn go, eh? If you saw my last community post you'll know that I haven't been very well over the last, well, month now, but I've been desperate to get back to painting again. So in this video I'm going to show you a little squirrel painting I did last week with the autumn watercolour palette I set up in my last video, even if it is more winter than autumn now. So I'm going to share my process, experiment with some new colour mixes and finish the last page in my sketchbook ready to start afresh with some new and exciting videos for winter. So I hope you enjoy it. I've already sketched my pencil outline in my sketchbook and put washi tape around the outside to give me a nice white border. The reference photo is from Pixabay and if you want to try this one out for yourself I'll put a link to that in the description box below. I'll also include a link to the video where I set up this palette if you haven't seen it and want to go and give it a watch. For my brushes I'm using a few smaller ones today as this is a small sketchbook. So I have a half inch silver black velvet flat brush, a size 4 silver black velvet round brush, an old stiff synthetic brush that I use for lifting out highlights, and a very small Chinese calligraphy brush that I use for really small details, like on the eyes. Before I start I lightly spritz the paints with water to activate them and I'm good to go. To begin with I couldn't really decide what I wanted to do with the background on this painting so I'm going to leave that till the end. Normally I like to plan things out a bit more but for this little sketchbook painting I just wanted to relax and go with the flow. What I did know was that I wanted soft fuzzy edges around the squirrel's tail so that's where I'm going to start. To achieve the look I'm going for I'm going to paint wet into wet so first I need to prepare the colours I'm going to use. Looking at the reference photo I can see warm brown hues, oranges and even some purpley colours. So I'm going to use mainly burnt sienna but I'm going to add in some transparent orange, burnt umber and maybe even some of Roman Schmall's hematite violet shade. My aim is to have them bleed together on the surface of the wet paper to help add interest and variation. When painting wet into wet, controlling where your paint edges stop can be tricky, but it's all about water control, and I'll put a link to a video I did about that in the card above. I've switched over to the flat brush now, and first I'm pre-wetting my paper with clean water, taking the edge of the water past where my pencil lines are, or past where I want the paint edge to stop. You're aiming for a nice even sheen all over the surface of your paper where you're going to paint. Now I've switched to my size 4 round brush. It is damp but I've taken off any extra water by dabbing it onto a paper towel before I dip it into the paint. This will prevent me from flooding my already damp paper with more water and will help to ensure my paint doesn't spread out too far. Here I'm starting with the burnt sienna. It also helps to direct your brush strokes from where you want your fuzzy edge to be inwards, if that makes sense, because then you are pulling any excess water and paint away from that edge, allowing you to have more control. The paint edge is still soft because our initial waterline extended beyond the pencil line. A continuous brush stroke like I'm doing here will also allow you to maintain that control. Now I'm adding more burnt sienna whilst the paper is still damp, but I'm still taking off any excess moisture in my brush to avoid any unwanted blooms. I add in some of the hematite too, just in the middle of the tail here. And some orange to boost the colour a bit. By this time though the paper had begun to dry, so I decided to leave it to dry completely and come back to it later. 
So next, I decided to paint a first layer of the same burnt sienna onto the body. And despite this being a fairly quick painting, you can see the light dip in and out a bit here. So my apologies for that, but hopefully it's not too distracting. I use the same method as for the tail to achieve soft edges around the squirrel's body, painting on clean water beyond the pencil line first, and then using a smaller brush to paint on the first layer of paint. On this side though, I added a darker Van Dyke brown into the shadow areas. This is still painting onto damp paper, but I still like to use my brush strokes in the direction of fur growth. It helps it look a bit more natural. Now with that side drying, I'm going to paint the squirrel's chest. The fur here isn't really white, so I'm going to mix a neutral colour of my own. For this, I tried adding some aureolin to the hematite already on my palette, and tested the resulting mix on a separate piece of watercolour paper. It was a bit on the olive green side to start with, but I like the granulation and texture that the hematite added. So I played around with the proportions until I got a colour I was happy with. I dropped this onto damp paper again, and just let the paint bleed across the surface of the paper. I concentrated most of the pigment onto the lower half of the chest. Now with that all dry, I can paint the rest of the squirrel's body. For this, I decided to paint a watery base layer of my burnt sienna all over, but this time painting onto dry paper. My thinking was that the burnt sienna is not a staining pigment, so I'd be able to lift out any highlights later using my small flat bristly brush. And painting wet on dry would enable me to get a good base layer that I could build on, either by dropping in other colours onto the paper whilst it's still damp, or by adding subsequent layers once this one had dried. So that's what I did. That dried quite quickly, so I could move on to painting the branch. I was looking forward to this, as I wanted to experiment with a few of the new granulating colours on my palette, and wasn't worried about replicating the colours or details from the reference photo. I started off painting the dark area between and around the squirrel's feet, using a more concentrated mix of the hematite violet shade. In its mass tone, this colour is a rich dark purpley brown, but when you add water, it separates out beautifully, and is perfect for adding texture. Next, while this area of branch was still damp, I added some Vivianite blue ochre. This is one of Roman Schmall's earth pigments, and with its granulating properties, also helped to add texture. I painted this branch in the same way. To paint the details on the squirrel's eye, nose and mouth, I switched to my smallest brush. I love painting eyes as it really brings the animal to life. I'd already painted a light wash of French ultramarine blue and let it dry before painting the darkest parts of the eyelids using the hematite again. Then for the pupil, I used Payne's grey over the top. Being careful to leave a little highlight, that really helps to make the eye look shiny. I'll speed this up just a little bit as I did take my time over it. It was quite fiddly. With that done though, I could start to paint the second layer and build up my values on the fur. I've done a bit on the face already. I didn't just want to use burnt sienna again though, as like I mentioned before, I could also see some orange and purple tones on the reference photo. So I decided to experiment a bit with the transparent orange and permanent magenta on my palette. For soft edges and seamless colour mixes, I pre-wet the area of fur I wanted to paint first with clean water before dropping in paint. Here I'm dropping in the permanent magenta. It's transparent, so layers really beautifully over the burnt sienna. Then further down this front leg, I add in some of the transparent orange too, and let the colours mix together on the paper. 
It's quite bright, but I really like the intense pop of colour. And I'm thinking that perhaps having a smaller palette with a more limited number of colours can actually make you more experimental than if you had a whole range of colours to choose from. You also learn more about the pigments in your palette and how they mix together, and there are endless possibilities. Until now, I've not been one to make colour mixing charts, but this little painting has inspired me, and I think I could learn a lot from giving it a try. Let me know if you've ever made colour mixing charts of your own with the paints in your palette. Anyway, I continue to build up the depth of colour on the fur here just by using these same two colours, transparent orange and permanent magenta, either as pops of colour on their own or mixed together. I applied them onto wet paper where I wanted soft edges or smooth blends, or onto dry paper as a glaze, softening out any unwanted hard edges with a clean damp brush. But the light was fading fast on my painting session, so I decided to finish the background off the next day. That at least gave the painting a chance to dry completely, and with fresh eyes I was better able to decide what to do with the background. So rather than paint it exactly like the reference photo, I wanted to do something more suggestive and subtle. And rather than opt for the bright sap green or the intense forest green, I chose to mix a more muted green. I used some of the shadow green and loosely mixed in some aureolin and some of the vivianite I'd used on the branch. Here I'm pre-wetting the area around the squirrel with clean water so I can drop in paint and have it bleed out gently on the surface of the damp paper. As you can see I was a bit tentative at first because I didn't want to paint over the fuzzy fur edges I'd created and I definitely could have gone darker, but I do still like the softer look I've achieved and how it helped to add depth to my painting and give the squirrel's fur a bit of a backlit glow. Now, after adding another layer to the fur on the squirrel's body and some more detail to the centre of the tail, I'm going to lift out some highlights using my small synthetic size 1 flat brush. The painting is completely dry, so I dampen my brush, sop up any excess water on a paper towel and gently begin to lift off some of the paint. It's really important if you're using this technique for the first time to test it out on a scrap piece of your watercolour paper first and go carefully. You don't want to damage your paper and your painting right at the end. I would say ideally use 100% cotton paper too, as it holds up to more abuse. But if that's not possible, definitely test the paper you're using first to avoid any disappointment. A few other tips for using this technique are to keep a piece of paper towel to hand for lifting the paint off the paper. And you also need to clean your brush frequently between liftings to avoid transferring paint from your brush onto other areas of your painting. It's also important to remember that not all watercolours are equal when it comes to lifting, so you might want to check out the individual properties of the watercolours you have beforehand. Now before I add in the little white whiskers, I'm just giving this background a bit of a boost with another layer. I think this is an improvement, but let me know what you think. So to finish off, I'm trying this new Molotow White acrylic paint pen. It has a 1mm nib, and I was curious to try these after seeing them on Natasha Newton's channel. Normally I'd use a Uniball Signo white gel pen, white gouache or white ink, but they've all got their drawbacks. This though seems to give a nice solid line, and it's nice and white and thin too, so it gets a thumbs up from me. This was a really fun little painting and I really hope you enjoyed watching it come together. Please give this video a thumbs up if you did like it, and comment below with any questions or ideas for future videos. Thank you so much for watching, take care, stay well, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye!